Oftentimes we hear people say that we should live before God and not before men. But is such a view fully biblical? No, of course we hear biblical instructions which says whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working not for men but for the Lord. Or we could recall what the Apostle Paul said, Am I trying now to win the approval of human beings or of God? And we hear him say those words to justify that he wasn't pleasing men but God. Now, verses like that gives us a very fundamental proposition of the Christian living. That is, we have to seek to live before God and not men. It corrects our motives for doing certain things. It reminds us of the danger of externalism. It tells us that godliness is something that is within us. It involves our response to the things of God, which produces obedience and righteous living. And everyone should keep that in mind, because whatever we do, we must know that God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And I think every true Christian should bear that in mind, just as the Christian reformers always exhort believers to live before the face of God. No question of that. But in this episode, I'd like to bring out another thought-provoking concept about living before men. You see, just as the true Christian men and women should seek to live before God, but should he or she totally disregard how they live before men? Should they even consider how men think? Is man's view about the things we do totally invalidated? Now you see, in my pastoral life, I have encountered extremely pious people who say, Pastor, I just do right before God. I don't care what men think as long as I am right before God. You see, my question to such a person is, how do you know you are right? You see, you can be right before your own eyes, but may not be so before God. Why do I say that? Because if you do not have the validation of men, how do you know you are right before God? Don't forget, we are told in the Bible to not only submit to God, but to also submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So my brethren, if men around you, if your pastor, your cell leaders, or your close brethren, do not feel your meekness and submission, how do you know you're really submitting to Christ? If people who praise for you are doubtful about your choice and decision, isn't it wise to think twice? So you see, just as it is important to live before God, but in this regarding man's opinion about us, we run the danger of self-validating our rightness. Someone may say, I'm abiding to the word of God, the Bible is my standard, but the problem is this, Everyone can claim that he is a Bible believer or a Bible adherer, but there is a possibility that he could only be submitting to a certain portion of the Bible. He could be doing one thing and not the other. He could be reading the Bible piously and not involved in church life or the serving of others. Or he could be so heavily involved in church life and miss taking good care of his family. Either way. But the point is, you see, the problem with people who are right in their own eyes is that they tend to be selective in obedience. So let's take a moment to consider, is living before men, doing good and doing right before men something that is required of in Christian living? Well, let us consider a verse in the scripture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21. And Paul said right here, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Notice this, in the eyes of men. Now the context of this is Paul was telling the believers that he is very cautious and scrupulous in managing the financial gifts given to the church. He not only makes sure he will do it right before God, he will also do it right before men. You saw that? That gives a whole concept that we cannot be just validating our own actions before God. It has to be validated before men also. When we say we are acting biblically, who is there to hold us accountable? Who is there to inform us that we are not just selectively obeying God? So living before men and being accountable to them is not something we can dispense with in Christian living. And that is why we need a good church life. We need good co-workers and accountability partners in our life. Of course, no one is above reproach, but let's not forget the instruction of our Lord Himself to let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So just as the Bible verifies our works, man verifies them too. But over here, I'd like to take this message a bit further because I've often come across people who have some estrangement between their responsibility to God and to men. 
Some are so humanistic that they forgot about living before God altogether. They are totally absorbed in pleasing men. May God have mercy on such people. But on the other hand, there are some who are so scrupulous that they see any consideration of human needs as humanistic or indicative of human elements. I've heard people say, Pastor, you should just preach the word of God. There is no need to consider the needs or the problems of men because by doing so, that is satisfying the itching ears of men and that's humanistic. Well, I've been in Christ long enough to hear such views. I mean, yes, that's a noble idea. We preachers are told to preach the word of God. But are we really told to not consider the needs of men? To not consider their cries? To not consider their situations? Now may I ask, how is the preacher going to fulfill his duties to correct, rebuke, and encourage? You see, the preaching of the word is not just doing a Bible study. Preaching of the word is an expository of the word primarily, and then also to be well connected to the application of the word. There are subjectivities involved in preaching the word of God. They are correcting, rebuking, and encouraging involved, although some of them are not pleasing to the ears. But they are needed for men to come to Christ himself, to obey Christ, not just getting the knowledge of Christ. So while the preacher preaches the word of God in full, he is also called to apply the word and to rebuke and encourage with the word. So in such a case, can a preacher not consider the needs of men when he reads the word of God and formulate his sermon? My answer is no. You see, even the incarnated word came in the form of flesh to relate what the word of God is. He was with sinners. He knew their problems. He observed their lives and gives them very relevant parables to teach them or to rebuke them or to draw them back to God. When Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, he addressed their disunity and even some of their sins. And yes, all with the word of God. When the Prince of Preacher, Charles Spurgeon preaches, he preached on contemporary events. He preached against ministers absorbed in politics. He preaches against the Oxford movements. The faithful preacher, while preaching from the word, he is not blind to the needs of men or the needs of an era. You see, we can be over-spiritual and miss being spiritual. We can be over-religious and miss pure religion. James tells us that pure religion is one that visits the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions. It is a religion by faith in the Son of God, and that faith is ultimately shown by his care of others. Such a person cares for the needs of others. He is not just absorbed in the meaning of the word and misapplying the word. So in this sense, when a preacher is called to preach the word of God, he is to preach a sermon. But what is a sermon? In the words of Pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones, to preach a sermon is not to run a commentary. A preacher is not only to give the meaning of a verse or a passage or a paragraph. Yes, that is essential in expository preaching, but that is only the introduction of a sermon. A sermon must come as a whole form. So while every preacher should preach an expository sermon, he is to receive a sermon, or in other words, a burden of God for the people he is ministering to. So let's not be confused. Let's not be unbalanced. Let's be clear that we as believers have a responsibility both to God and man. We are obligated to do right before God and before man so that glory be to God alone.